Leadership requires leaders. Well, that seems like a pretty overly obvious truth, doesn't it? But experience teaches us that the, this principle is not always recognized. If you've ever been under a bad leader, then you know the truth of that statement. It really does require leadership. Israel, in Je Exodus chapter 18, is suffering a leadership crisis. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, visits, and we're going to see that he recognizes the problem they're having and offers a solution. How do you have a crisis if you have successful leadership? That's the question. First of all, as David pointed out, the real leader was the Lord God. He would brought them out of Egypt. He had defeated the Egyptians, wiped out their army, demonstrated that their gods were nothing, and that there was only one God. Very successful. Never had been done before in the history of the world. And here God has led them out. How in the world could they have a crisis of leadership when God is your leader? But they were in a crisis in terms of leadership. Secondly, they were led by a humble leader. To have a humble leader who was in daily contact with the Lord. Moses was getting his orders directly from God. How in the world could you have a crisis of leadership if you're getting your orders directly from God and you're passing it on to people? How could you have difficulty in a group when you're, you're being led by God and you're being led by one of the most humble men on the face of the earth? The meekest men is the way he described himself. Moses was one of the meekest men on the face of the earth. Uh, no humble man could write that, could he? You have to be a meek man to do that. What's the problem? Well, Moses is giving excellent decisions, but it takes forever to get your case heard. They're in a real crisis of leadership. The leadership that had been adequate for speaking to Pharaoh and getting them out of Egypt would not work as they became a nation that was a holy nation before God. And don't forget, they're in the process of moving to becoming a holy people of God. What kind of a leadership is going to be required for that? Well, here's the principle. Leadership requires leaders, not just a leader. The S makes all the difference. It requires leaders, not just a leader. We're going to look at verses 1 to 12 of our chapter today. Exodus chapter 18, you should be there by now. If you've got the electronic medium, you just have to punch the button at the bottom, I think, and it'll take you there. But generally, we're just going to be in Exodus 18, so you can stick there. What does success look like? That's in verses 1 through 12. And then secondly, in the last part of the chapter, verses 13 to 27, we're going to see how leadership make success sustainable. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Fathers, we come now to your word. We ask, Father, that you will teach us not only what success is, the success that you want to give to us, but, Father, you'll show us how to accomplish that throughout our lifetime. Lord, no matter where you lead us, no matter what you have us do, Father, we will make progress in that direction in pleasing and honoring you and being good leaders and good stewards of the gifts that you have given to us. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will teach us your word today. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Success is in three areas in this passage. First of all, we recognize that Moses was successful in rescuing Israel from Egypt. Verse 1 says, Moses' father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, heard about everything God had done for Moses and his people, the Israelites. He heard especially about how the Lord had rescued them from Egypt. Now, we know he didn't get a tweet. He wasn't on Facebook. He didn't see pictures of the Red Sea. Israel has moved as fast as two million people and cattle could move. And yet, Jethro already has heard everything about what happened in Egypt. He's heard the success story. It has come some way across the deserts of Sinai. It has come to him that God has delivered these people out of Egypt. It's amazing. It's tremendous news. When God is in the leadership, people get rescued from what they're entrapped in. They get saved, is the word we tend to use. They get saved from the mess they're in, from the disaster that sin produces in our life. God wants to rescue people from the enslavement, rescue them from the difficult situations, not necessarily by taking us out all the time, but oftentimes by joining us there where we are. But in this case, God has brought a whole people, a whole nation, and we estimate about 2 million people. We know later on when they do the census in the book of Numbers, there's about 603,550 fighting men between the ages of 20 and 50. 
And so we estimate from that, well, there could well have been two million people that God has brought these people out. He's delivered them out of Egypt. What a tremendous thing that God has done uh, through Moses in bringing them out. Uh, one of my favorite stories from Sunday school is about Moses leading them across the Red Sea. You read about that and talked about that this morning. A uh, little boy came home. His mom asked him, said, what did you learn in Sunday school today? He said, well, we learned about the, the Red Sea crossing. Oh, really? Tell me about that. He said, well, said, Moses had gotten his army backed up to the Red Sea. And so, uh, you know, the, the enemy army was coming at him, so he called in an airstrike. And then they got transport, air transport, and they transport everybody across the Red Sea. And he said, I don't think that's what happened. Are you sure that's what they told you in Sunday school? She said, no, but you wouldn't believe what they told me in Sunday school. <laughs> well, it takes the power of God to rescue a nation out of Egypt out of the most powerful nation on earth, and to bring them out. The same power is available to rescue you and me, to rescue sinners from the grip of Satan and bring them into a relationship with a holy God, to take sinners like us and lift us up out of our condition, fill us with his spirit, and to lead us into holiness as a manner of life. The Bible says God wants to do that. Oftentimes when God does that, he brings about the second thing that took place in this chapter. Verses 2 through 7, we find a reunion with his father-in-law and family. Verse 2 says, Earlier, Moses had sent his wife Zipporah and his two sons back to Jethro, who had taken them in. My suspicion is, because it was dangerous in Egypt, he sent his family home. He's a little busy. I don't have time to do all the things I need to do. And so they went back to uh, the grandfather, went back to her father, and now he's bringing them. Uh, and he goes on to tell us about his firstborn, Gershom, who was named because he says, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. We talked about that. The second son, verse 4, was named Eliezer. For Moses said, the God of my ancestors was my helper. He rescued me from the sword of Pharaoh. Remember, Moses was about to be killed. He was a very successful failure in Egypt. He hadn't done so well. But God had rescued him out of that. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, verse 5, now came to visit Moses in the wilderness. And he brought Moses' wife and two sons with, them, with him. And they arrived while Moses and the people were camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent a message to Moses saying, I, Jethro, your father-in-law, am coming to see you with your wife and your two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. He bowed low and kissed him. And they asked about each other's welfare and then went into Moses' tent. So here in this situation, there's a reunion. There's a family reunion. Moses is getting his wife, his children back. He gets to meet this godly father-in-law who had been a blessing to him, uh, who knew God but did not know God in all of his power as he's about to learn. There is this reunion, and they ask about each other's welfare. The word there is the shalom. Have you heard the word shalom? The word translated welfare in this version, and in, in most versions, uh, it's the word shalom. Uh, how, how is your peace? How are things with, do you have peace in your life? Are you in a position of having shalom in your life? Are things going well with you? Or has something disturbed the peace in your life? And then in verses 8 to 12, success is seen in the response people have to the working of God in life. He goes on in verse 8 and he says, Moses told his father-in-law everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh in Egypt on behalf of Israel. He also told about all the hardships they had experienced along the way and how the Lord had rescued his people from all their troubles. Now notice verse 9. Here's the right response to a testimony like that. Jethro was delighted when he heard about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel as he rescued them from the hand of the Egyptians. There was delight and there was joy in this success. We're going to find later on as we read the story of, of Moses and uh, going through Exodus, there are some people that did not like that success. In fact, we didn't really have time last week to get all the way through chapter 17. The Amalekites, their cousins, were less than enthusiastic. Would be a fair way of saying that, wouldn't you say? Uh, they tried to kill them. They tried to attack Israel because they didn't like the fact that God was doing something for Israel. Jethro, on the other hand, has the right response to that. He says in verse 10, Praise the Lord, for he has rescued you from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh. Yes, he has rescued Israel from the powerful hand of Egypt. I know now that the Lord is greater than all other gods, 
because he has rescued his people from the oppression of the proud Egyptian. And then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. Aaron and all the elders of Israel came out and joined him in a sacrificial meal in God's presence. They were having communion. He offered a sacrifice. They all participated together in fellowship and worship of the Lord and enjoying and rejoicing in the things of God there and what God had done. This is the man who was the priest of Midian. He was a man who led in worship. He was a spiritual influence upon Moses. He was not always over Moses, but he was for about 40 years, teaching and training and working with Moses. He is leading this man, and this is success that's going on. Now, this next slide shows you a little bit about, yeah, that's it, about the structure of this passage. You might want to make some notes there or get a copy of this or follow this later. But there's a parallel structure to these verses, to 1 through 12 and 13 to 27. Uh, there's a scenario that's set up in both situations. And then somebody speaks. In the first part, it's Moses that speaks and tells what God has done. In the second part, Jethro gives an address to Moses, gives him advice, good advice. And then in the first part, Jethro responds to what the Lord has done. In the latter part, Moses responds. And so there's a parallel structure of the way Moses has put this thing together to help us see there's a responsive thing that's going on here. All right, let's go on. That's just a little extra help for you in Sunday school. But when success comes, as it did, particularly numerical success, it brings the problem of sustainability. God has done wonderful things for the Israelites, but now things have got to change. There's problems going on. Verse 13 says, The next day Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other, and they waited before him from morning till evening. 603,550 men, minimum. How many of those do you think had problems? If it was 10%, that's more than 6,000, isn't it? Like more than 60,000. I mean, you got all these people. I'm just checking your math. I just want to see how good your decimal moving skills are. All right? Uh, 60,000 people. Well, let's say it wasn't that. Let's say 1%. Well, that's like 6,000. You got a line 6,000 people long waiting. I was in one of those uh, checking out. 6,000 people in front of me. No, it wasn't quite that bad, but it's like, good grief, are we ever going to get there? Uh, and every case has to be heard. And, you know, for every dispute, there's always three sides. You wear that? There's three sides to every dispute. There's your side and their side, and then there's what? Really have the truth, right? That's, here's what really happened. Here's the thing. And so Moses has to hear all of this. There is a disruption of the peace in Israel. And let's say he was better than modern courts. I'm just making the assumption he's better than a modern courtroom. A modern courtroom in the United States, if you get, what does it take? A month, maybe? Complicated trial? Right, let's, let's assume he can do 10 a day. He's got a backlog. And there's discontent building up. Uh, and it's from morning to evening. He's, he's getting nothing done except hearing these cases and rendering a decision in, in some major and some minor dispute. Some things that you're thinking, why on earth do I have to deal with this? Couldn't somebody else answer this question? Couldn't somebody else deal with this? <laughs> you encounter that, do you? <laughs> well, that teaches you going to law enforcement. <laughs> the, uh, you know, you got what in the world is wrong with these people? And uh, you can imagine how well our country would run if every decision in America had to be decided. Well, let's just say Louisiana. Every decision in Louisiana had to go before Governor Edwards, John Bell Edwards. And you couldn't, you couldn't settle anything until it went directly to the governor. Uh, we'd have to stop living in a state. You just can't do it. There's a crisis of leadership. It's disrupted the peace. Now, in order to settle this issue, you have to have somebody that's going to, I can't read that word there, Issues. Uh, p issues disrupt the peace. You're going to have to have somebody that can render a judgment about the issue. The word here is mishpat. I told you about shalom. The word shalom means peace. You can learn another Hebrew word. It's the word mishpat. It means judgment. It ma brings making decision, hearing the situation, and rendering. Here's the judgment of the Lord. Here's the judgment in this case. Moses is doing that all himself, and he's building up a problem there. Jethro sees this, and he says, verse 14, What are you really accomplishing here? What are you trying, why are you trying to do the, all this alone while everyone stands around you from morning till evening? Now, I would encourage you to think about this 
in terms of how to approach somebody that you're not really in authority over, maybe you're in authority under, and there's some lessons to learn here, and maybe we can talk about that in Sunday school. But here I just want to point out, Jethro recognizes the problem. He sees what's going on. He knows the problem is one man is trying to solve every issue, and you can't do that. Moses said, verse 15, because the people come to me to get a ruling from God. When a dispute arises, they come to me, and I'm the one who settles the case between the quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's decree and give them this instruction. And Moses' father-in-law said, this is not good. Well, that's a polite way of saying this is a lousy system you got here, son. This is not going to work. Israel had this problem. It led to a personal and a national crisis. Jethro's recognizing, my son-in-law is going to wear himself out if he keeps doing what he's doing. He is just going to flat wear himself out. Secondly, the people are getting frustrated because of this wait. It's just aggravating. People don't like to wait. They want the issue settled. They want it resolved so we can go back to having peace. Remember, peace is disrupted by issues. Issues are settled by judgment, and judgment restores the peace. Now we understand what we're doing. That involves leadership. So he says, let me give you good advice, verse 19, and may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative before God, bringing their disputes to him, Teach them God's decrees and give them His instructions. That's your job. Show them how to conduct their lives, because they don't know. We'll see that in a moment. But select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but have them bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. If you follow this advice, and if the Lord commands you to do so, then you will be able to endure the pressures, and all these people will go home in shalom. They will go home in peace. Now what's he saying? Well, he's saying you need some leaders. Leadership is crucial in spiritual endeavors. It just is required. Why do you need leadership? Why is that required? Well, because people don't know how to live in a way that pleases the Lord. Don't know how to live in holiness before God. Israel didn't know because they didn't have the Bible. How much Bible did they have? Remember Moses wrote Genesis to Deuteronomy. They didn't even have the beginning. They didn't know anything about the Word of God. They had another problem. You and I have got that solved. We've got the Bible in several different versions. I can even change the text size so I can read it. And the weight doesn't go up. It's really tremendous. They didn't have that, but they had another problem that you and I have. They were carnal people. They were flesh. How many of y'all were born in the flesh? Some of you are worrisome. Uh, <clears throat> mercy. Holiness is foreign to our nature. There is something inside every one of us that screams out for wickedness. Screams out for not what God wants what I want. That's what it ought to be. Every person in this room has that problem. It is our natural state. We were born into that. I want what I want, and if the world doesn't adjust to that, the world is wrong. I want what I want. If that's not the will of God, it ought to be the will of God. God ought to do what I want to do. Why can't God do what I want Him to do? Why can't God make this work out in my life? Well, because you're going about it wrong. Well, what difference does that make? I'm just relating some things from counseling sessions. No names involved, but it's like, it's never going to work out that way. It's not designed to work out. God will not work it out that way. There is something within us that does not know what holiness is and even how to go about living a holy life. It requires leadership to teach us God's way. We have a book on holy living. In fact, to some of you, if you've got a cover on the thing, it says Holy Bible. Well, that's a pretty good title. It's telling you how do you live in holiness before God. You see, Israel is on their way out of Egypt. They've come through great hardships there in the desert. And they're on the way to Mount Sinai in the desert to meet God and encounter a holy God. And they need to know how to deal with that. How do you live when a holy God is with you all the time, watching everything you do? How do you live in holiness? They're going to learn. But they're also going to learn how wicked people do it because for all the teaching and instruction, they're bringing that wickedness right along with them. 
that sin principle inside of them is always going to be there. They don't know how. They need leadership to tell them and to show them how. Leadership is crucial because even saved people have disputes with one another. I know that's shocking. That uh, How many of y'all are married? All right, leave your hands up. If you're married, uh, how many of you have never had a dispute? Okay, at least honesty is, we, we'll get to honesty later. At least. You know, if you've got two people and they both think alike, one of you is unnecessary. You know, it, it's just the way it goes. Uh, there were disputes in the early church. It's not something sign that something's wrong in church when you have disputes. Peter, the apostle who spoke on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people got saved. That's a good sermon response right there, isn't it? When he went to the Gentiles, he got crawled by the church when he went back. The very idea of you going into Gentiles and even eating with them. What are you doing, Peter? There was dispute. Had to be settled. Paul and Barnabas had a falling out. They had to split the territory. They couldn't even work in the same territory anymore. The dispute was so sharp. We read in, in the book of Philippians about Yodia and Syntyche who couldn't come to the same mind in the Lord. They were, had such a sharp dif difference. Now, at least Paul and Barnabas could separate. Yodia and Syntyche, what are they going to do? Going to have uh, new Philippi and old Philippi? Will just have two different churches? No, you're in the same church. You've got to figure out how to get along, how to be of the same mind in the Lord. Disputes are normal. Settling those disputes is a function of leadership. Let me point out one other thing here that I think fits here. People are to be led by men. I'll give you a minute. Yeah, the world got got that back mixed up. Remember that thing I said about everybody wants, you know, I, I really, I've said often, I really don't care who's in charge as long as things go my way. We ought to all have that attitude. I want things to go the way I want them to go. I don't care who, who does it or who's in charge. I'm glad Chris is going to be in charge of the, the breakfast on Christmas morning. That'd take a lot of load off of me. Uh, it's his idea. No, I said... <laughs> God raises men up in leadership in the home and in the church. Now, I think there are specific roles that are best filled by women. There are ministries which are better accomplished by women. For instance, teaching a woman how to be a godly wife. Not a man in this room qualified to teach that course, right? I have no idea. Helping women deal with trauma, such as rape, requires female chaplains. In the IFCA, we have accepted women into the chaplaincy. Let them join the IFC because they recognize you don't want a male chaplain talking to a woman that's been raped. That's, that's not going to work. You need, she needs a female chaplain, health care chaplain, to talk to her about that. There are things that, that just absolutely require women, and they are much better at it all the way around. Sometimes women are, are better leaders than men. But leadership in the home and in the church requires men to be involved in leadership. That's not the place for women to lead. The teaching of the congregation and leading the congregation is expected of men. How many of y'all are men here today? Okay. Uh, that's your job. When men fail to lead, the church fails. Men fail to leave, the home fails. One of these days, every man in this congregation is going to stand before God, and he's going to ask you about your leadership of your home. Did you step up to leadership in the church? Did you carry out your, that? I'm, I'm telling you, this is going to be on the final. The oral examination is coming, and that's going to be the question. How did you do in leadership? Tell me about your leadership. I gave you a wife. How did you lead her? I gave you children. How did you lead them? I gave you the opportunity to be a leader in the church. How did you handle that? Now, if men don't lead, women will. And men are sorry enough <coughs> to let them. And that's a serious mistake in the home, and it's a serious mistake in the church. Jethro said you need to find good men. What do you look for? Well, you, you need men that have credentials. Men that have the right credentials for being leaders. They're qualified to be spiritual leaders. By the way, in the church, we're looking for deacons. I've got one of these on the board. This is the deacon job description. Here's the qualification. Starts on the bottom here, it goes to the back. You need to take a look at that. In the church, one of the areas of leadership is for deacons. We want men who meet the qualification. Well, what do we learn here about the credentials? First of all, he says you need to find guys that are capable. You need men that are capable. You need to find guys that can get the job done. Verse 21 says, select from all the people some capable. First requirement, you need to find guys that can do the job. Now, 
Oftentimes, leadership is demonstrated by past performance, but not always. Would you have picked Moses to rescue Israel? I wouldn't have. He tried once, and it was a miserable failure. He had to leave the country. Forty years, he had to lead sheep so he could learn the process. He had to get married, had to raise a family, had to begin doing some of the things. But generally, you look at, well, how has this person performed in the past? Are they able to do things? Are they able to get things done? Are you a doer? That's absolutely essential in leadership. Men need to demonstrate the ability to do this job that we want them to fulfill. Now, some of these guys may not have been the very best of warriors, but they were good leaders. Skill in one area doesn't always mean your skill in this. Can you accomplish tasks? Can you get things done? Learning to lead a wife and children is a man's workshop for spiritual leadership. Wives ought to be praying and helping your husband to become a leader like God expects them to be. You know how you become a good leader? You start out as a bad leader and you make mistakes. Now, if you don't make mistakes, you're not really leading. If you make a decision and everybody likes it, you lucked out, maybe, or else you're not really leading. Somebody's not going to like some decision you made, something you say, something, some way that you carry things. They're going to say, well, I think it ought to be this way, or I don't think I'd have done that. I've never heard of a church that had a discipline, church discipline situation, where there wasn't somebody who said, well, I know they were wrong, but they shouldn't have done it that way. Not everybody's going to like what you do. Learning to raise children and to lead a wife will teach you that. Pause for a moment while that sinks in. If your wife likes everything you've done, that's not a good sign, usually. If you've got more than one child and those children like everything you do, you're probably not doing much because your children will let you know, I don't, I don't think you're being fair. I don't think this is right. Uh, hopefully they'll do it respectfully, but they'll let you know. It's where you learn. Leadership experience in life can make a man a better leader. You've got to do it. Look for people that have the capability. These are folks that have capability. Secondly, he said, look for honest men. Leaders need to be honest even to their own detriment. Write down 2 Kings 22, 7. Uh, Josiah and remodeling the temple, they take up this huge offering to, to refurbish the temple, to restore it after it had been neglected. He said, give the money to these men. Don't require them in accounting. They're honest men. That's an honest guy. When people say, you can give him the money, we know He's going to use it all to do the job. You don't have to have to require accounting. It'll be done. That's honesty. Most people need an accountant over them, need to give an accounting of financial matters. When I gave, uh, was called upon to give the, the money, distribute the money from the IFCA relief effort in West Louisiana, I had to go give an accounting to the board uh, last month and had to go detail. Here's what we did. Here's where the money is. Here's exactly down to the penny. Here's where it is. Well, not because they didn't think I was honest. They might not have thought I was too smart, but they didn't think I was dishonest. But you want an accounting. These need to be men who are going to be honest, fair with others to the point of even wronging themselves rather than somebody else. He said you need honest men who fear God. That's the third quality. Leaders must fear God. You need to be capable. You need to be honest, but you also need to fear God. Why is that? Because substituting our wisdom... For God's wisdom is foolish. If you're going to render a spiritual decision, you need to talk to the great spirit and find out what does God say about it. So you don't substitute human wisdom for divine wisdom. You need to fear God. Joshua and the elders didn't fear God enough to ask them about advice. And in the book of Joshua chapter 9, you find them making a treaty with Gibeah. And they got saddled with the Gibeonites for the rest of their lives because they didn't ask God about it before they did what they did. Hezekiah showed the Babylonians everything in his house without asking God about it. And God said, you've doomed generations to come to Babylonia, to defeat by Babylon and even to Babylonian captivity. And Hezekiah said, well, like most guys would say, well, at least there'll be peace in my lifetime. At least it won't be a headache for me. At least I believe that was his attitude when he said that. Leaders need to fear God. Man is not capable of leadership. The job is just too big. We've got to have the capacity for spiritual leadership given to us by the Holy Spirit. Remember, innately, you are a carnal person. I'm talking to the men now. You women can relax. You're carnal, too, but in a different way. Men, men are carnal. Men are fleshly. 
And you do not have what it takes innately to be spiritual in your leadership. You're going to have to depend upon God and His Word and His Spirit and His wisdom to give you the right decision. Leaders must love justice so much that they hate bribes. He goes on to say, capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. You say, well, that's kind of like honesty. Well, it is a little bit, but really it's talking about justice. A bribe disturbs justice. We're going to see later on as we talk about the law, there's no place in the law for considering the poor. Well, this person's poor, let's give them the decision for them. In fact, the law says you shouldn't do that. You ought to decide the case on its merits, no matter how it's going to affect it. Well, this person, they can stand the loss better than this person. Let's decide for the guy that's got money instead of the guy that doesn't have money. No, that's not, that's just as bad as a bribe. You need to render the decision according to the merits of the case. What is the exact situation here? In order to be fair, in order to be just, you need to make that kind of decision. A little money under the table works corruption. Well, now you have a vested interest in it coming out a certain way. He said, you need to find men that hate, hate bribes. Cannot stand a bribe. In fact, would be, be willing to put somebody in jail if they were to offer them a bribe. We're going to read later on about a guy named uh, Balaam. And Balaam loved money, so much so that he was willing to destroy a whole people so he could get the money. Uh, Balaam, by the way, was a prophet of God who was out for profit. You can put that down. That's a whole sermon title right there. Leadership also requires community. I'm moving on here because we've got to wind up. It, it's too big of a job for one guy. You need a group of people. Now, the plan here was put in place proportional leadership. Uh, proportional leadership. Here's what it looks like. There are men over 10, 50, 100, and 1,000. Now, this is not the group. These are the number of leaders per thousand in this system. You had one leader was over everybody, and then you had leaders over hundreds, then you had leaders over 20, and then you had leaders over 10. I, I figured up, I think if I did the math right, I think it's 300 and, uh, 131 leaders for every thousand. That's a lot of leaders. But you see, some are going to deal with the very minor cases. You've got somebody you can go to, and, and they'll, they'll give you a decision. And if that's good with you and good with the other person, kind of like an arbiter, we're willing to accept that. That's fine. It's settled. It's solved. You don't even have to take that to court. You can settle that on the street right there. We can take care of that. Okay, we're all good. If not, then you've got another level up you can go. And another level, another level, before you finally get to Moses, and Moses has to take it to God and say, God, now what do we do? When you read through the uh, Pentateuch from Genesis to Deuteronomy, and particularly when you get on over into Numbers and then into Deuteronomy, you're going to encounter some decisions that Moses said, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm going to have to ask the Lord what would be the right thing to do in this situation. And then he came back and rendered a judgment, a decision for them. Disputes in small matters could be resolved before it came to Moses. And this is a process. It's a process. Now here's the question. Where are you as a leader? Where are you as a leader? Are you in the initial stages of learning how to lead your family? You got a wife, you got a family, okay. You're, you're in the lab situation, learning how to be a leader of the household of God. That's why you're there. That's why you got a wife, that's why you got kids. You're learning. What does it take to be a leader in God's house? If you do well there, you're accomplishing good things there, then you may be ready for the next stage. Okay, now you're getting prepared uh, in leadership. You're learning how to do that. Maybe you're ready to step up to the next level. Maybe you need to begin leading others. Maybe you ought to lead a Bible study group. Maybe you ought to work in Awana. Maybe you ought to take some responsibility in some areas that I'm going to do some things in leadership before I step up into being a leader in the church. I'm going to take responsibility in this area. And I'll lead a little group. Let me see how I do with other people. Let me see how I, I, I manage my own home pretty well. All right, now, how do I do in, in leading a group? How do I do with a Bible study group? How do I do with a fellowship group? How do I do with leading things in my neighborhood, leading things around? We've got projects going. How, how do I do it developing projects and working on things around the church? How, how do I carry these things out? If you prove yourself capable, then maybe you're ready. Now, by the way, a leader will never arrive. But leaders are often ready for a new challenge. I'm ready to step up to something else. Ready, God, what's the new challenge? Maybe for some of you that might be being a deacon or a pastor or a missionary 
or leading some ministry or being executive director of something or doing something like that. God may have you ready for that next level of leadership. What is the challenge that God, where are you in the process? Are you at the beginning? Are you stretching your muscles? Or are you ready now to be a leader in the church? We have several of these descriptions. If you're not ready, you ought to be reading this and find out what do I need to be ready? What's involved? You want some help in developing as a leader? Come talk to me. I'll be willing to sit down with you and, and work with you on that. Some things that you might need to know. Things that are involved in learning to be a better leader than you are now.